I am Roberta Ekafi, and I'm the great great granddaughter of Makbia Luta, which is uh, Chief Red Cloud that was involved in the Indian Wars and one of the main signers of the 1851 and 1868 treaty. And I, there's a historical relationship between the federal government and our Native American people that dates back to, I guess, 500 years. They first came ashore on the East Coast. So I look back and I think about all the laws that the federal government has passed since the signing of the treaty and one was we had a traditional form of government which was really strong they were our headsmen and our chiefs and they governed by uh, they had strict rules on how they governed uh, the people they were a very spiritual people and um, I think the federal government when they were Ironically, they were forced onto reservations at gunpoint. They came with always a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other hand. And, uh, and when we were put onto the reservations, the whole way of life changed for our people. This is advice I give to our Native people from my reservation, is that I look back again historically and what our what our chiefs wanted and what of our, our people wanted. And with the 1868 treaty, Red Cloud himself said to become educated. Become educated and learn all that you can. And so that was a part of our treaties too, health, education, and welfare. But yet it's everything was substandard. The education was substandard. The health was substandard, and, and it was health, education, and welfare. And there was minimal funding pumped into the reservations to be able to, to uh, provide a quality education that we see America getting to our people. So now we advance, we have a, a college, Oglala Lakota, community college that even has a master's level program and I think it's it was Red Cloud's vision or his dream that we would be able to live in today's world. In this insider exclusive investigative network TV show our news team goes behind the headlines in American Indian rights and treaties the story of the 1868 Treaty of Laramie to examine how James Leach of the James Leach law firm successfully won a major victory on behalf of the survivors of a Lakota Sioux couple killed on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota by holding the U.S. government liable under the term of their 148-year-old treaty, the 1868 Treaty of Laramie. Between 1867 and 1868, nine treaties concluded with the U.S. government and various Indian tribes each contained what is known as the Bad Man Provision. Within each of these provisions is a clause in which the United States promises to reimburse Indians for injuries sustained as a result of the wrongs committed by bad men among the whites or among other people subject to the authority of the United States. In 1868, one of those treaties, the Laramie Treaty, was negotiated between different tribes of the Sioux Indians and its commissioners on the part of the U.S. In the Laramie Treaty, the United States Treaty Commissioners included that famed Civil War hero, Lieutenant General William Tecumseh Sherman. 
Article 1 of the Laramie Treaty, as found in 15 Statute 635, contains two bad men provisions and reads in part, if bad men among the whites or among other people subject to the authority of the United States shall commit any wrong upon the person or property of Indians, the United States will, upon proof made to the agent and forwarded to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs at Washington City, will proceed at once to cause the offender to be arrested and punished according to the laws of the United States and also reimburse the injured person for the loss sustained. If bad men among the Indians shall commit a wrong or depredation upon the person or property of anyone, white, black, or Indian, subject to the authority of the United States and at peace therewith, the Indians herein named solemnly agree that they will, upon proof made to their agent and notice by him, deliver up the wrongdoer to the United States to be tried and punished according to its laws. And in case they willfully refuse to do so, the person injured shall be reimbursed for his loss from the annuities or other monies due or to become due to them under this or any other treaties made with the United States. On August 27, 2008, two members of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe, 26-year-old Kalani Randall and 22-year-old Robert Whirlwind Horse, were killed on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation by Timothy Hotz, a non-Sioux civilian who was driving drunk. He fled the scene and eventually was arrested. Hotz pled guilty to the involuntary manslaughter in the United States District Court and was sentenced to a very lenient federal prison of only 51 months. The victim's relatives were extremely unhappy with his life sentence. Under Article 1 of the Laramie Treaty Bad Men Provision, the surviving family member, James Richards, sued the U.S. government. Interestingly enough, no one anywhere had brought any lawsuit to enforce this treaty provision known as the Bad Man Clause until 1970. In the ensuing 40 years, a handful of suits were brought, but in every single case, the wrongdoer worked for the government. In fact, in the original lawsuit, it was clearly stated that the 1868 Bad Man Treaty provision applies to all white men and is not applicable to only agents or employees of the United States. The Treaty of 1868 has been previously recognized as an existing obligation of the U.S. serving as the source of judicially enforceable property and personal rights. Treaties with Indian tribes are enforceable contracts, and any disputes as to the meaning must be resolved against the U.S., the original drafter of the treaty. The original lawsuit was incorrectly dismissed by Judge Margaret M. Sweeney, a judge of the United States Court of Federal Claims, because she made a major mistake by ruling that the treaty provision only applied when the wrongdoer was a government employee. Jim Leach successfully appealed Judge Sweeney's mistaken decision despite the fact that the U.S. government has a horrible record of breaking their own treaties. He also knew that this same bad man treaty provision was in eight other treaties with other tribes throughout the West. So enforcing it in the Fort Laramie Treaty with the Sioux would set a precedent that is enforceable in all other treaties, creating significant financial liability for the United States. This landmark case is very significant because it established that U.S. courts must enforce the plain language of Native American treaties no matter if they are 150 years old and courts must recognize new claims to these treaties even if they have never been made before. The same mindset and precedent has been observed daily for the last 227 years following the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. Native Americans harmed by a wrong, a crime, committed by bad men among the whites are entitled to compensation from the federal government because the government guaranteed this by treaty even though the government had no role in the wrongdoing. Jim has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in South Dakota and across the nation. He has built a substantial reputation nationwide by consistently winning other cases other law firms have turned down and his amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Rapid City, South Dakota.
It is my great pleasure to introduce Terry Pachota and Jim Leach to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank nice you. Being here. Tell our audience a little bit about your law firms. Um, first to you, Jim. Well, I moved to South Dakota in uh, 1976 to work for the Wounded Knee Legal Defense Committee, defending people who were accused of crimes after Wounded Knee at Wounded Knee. And one thing just led to another, and here I am 41 years later still practicing law. And, and uh, Terry, I understand you asked me to bring this up for you. I'm just kidding, of course. But anyway, um, uh, you are a tribal member, aren't you? I'm an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Yes. And uh, I was born and raised in Colum. Uh, I uh, first started practicing at uh, what is called South Dakota Legal Services. I practiced there for a few years. Then I uh, went into private practice on the reservation at Mission. Right. I become United States Attorney, 79 to about 81. Yes. And I was the first uh, Native American United States Attorney. Tell our audience a little bit about this case and the significance of it, Jim. This case arose from a tragedy where a um, white man drove onto the Pine Ridge Reservation drunk, ran down and killed two Native Americans who were doing nothing more than walking on the side of the road. And it was really um, a treaty claim that made this case different from everything else. And that was the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which... Let me ask you a question, um, Terry. Why hadn't this case, why hadn't this same type of case, non-government employee, been brought before? Because everybody assumed that it didn't hold water? I think there's probably a couple of reasons. I think probably this provision that Jim talked about yeah. in the 1868 treaty is not that well known, yes. you know, among practitioners. And but, but let me interject here. It is the same bad man act that is in all of the eight or nine Sioux treaty treaties, right? Is that right? I think it's in. I think it's in more than treaties uh, up yeah. in the northern plains. Yeah. And Jim can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's in other treaties, yeah. you know, with tribes across the United States. So everybody kind of assumed that you would not succeed if you brought a claim like this, right? I, I think that probably there's. I mean, there are no regulations on it, yeah. and so you just sort of have this treaty provision, 1868. You know, when it was enacted, and people probably think, well, I don't know, the treaty is old and, you know, and I've never heard of this, there's not much precedent out there, therefore, uh, you know, they just don't pursue it. We, we in the introduction to the show, we show the actual treaty, you send it to an underline. Nowhere does it say anything about being a government or a non-government employee, does it? Exactly. Yeah. Now, in your appeal, you succeeded, right? We did. Have there been other cases that have followed your precedent setting games? I, I don't know. Yeah. There's no real way I would know because no one would necessarily call and tell me. Yeah. But um, the second major factor is that the families of the victims, which included uh, the six minor children of Kalani Randall, who was one of the people killed, uh, were received compensation from the federal government. And the compensation for the children was an annuity mm -hmm. that'll pay out over the course of their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So it has a significant positive benefit for Are you them. allowed to say how much the settlement was for? I'm not allowed to say, but it was yeah. very significant. Let's talk about these treaties and let's talk about Indian law, okay? Um, this treaty was signed in 1868. And uh, in 1874, all of a sudden, nobody remembered the treaty, right? Because it was gold discovered in those Black Hills, right? A lot of, quote unquote, white people uh, came in and they just took the gold, right? What was any, what, what legal actions happened as a result of that? Nothing? Well, there's, there's been a whole century and a half of Indian law. Yeah. But by and large, uh, the whites win and the Indians lose. Not every single time, yeah. but 
when you're in court in Indian law, that's what you're fighting. And you're, you're really fighting a presumption that the dominant society yeah. deserves to prevail over the natives. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of ironic because people say, well, the treaty, that was, that's old, that was back in 1868. Well, we live under a constitution that was adopted in 1787 no one says that's too old to apply. Right, right, right. And it was um, it was affirmed, I think, 1789, right? So that's older than the treaties, right? Much older. I understand we have a leading expert that represents the tribes with us today, Roberta Equifey. So let's it is my great pleasure to introduce Roberta. Welcome to the show, Roberta. I'm glad to be here. Tell our audience a little bit about what you do for the, what you've done for the last 40 years for the American Indian movement. Well, I got involved um, in 71. That was my first involvement. And I was very young at the time with the murder of Raymond Yellow Thunder in a border town close to our reservation. Mm -hmm. Where he was made to dance naked in American Legion Hall and then killed and stuffed into a trunk of a car. Now, you did this at great risk to yes, yourself. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. What, what happened to you? Once you step foot off the reservation, you do confront a lot of racism. Yes. And that we weren't going to tolerate that anymore, you know. Yes. At least bring it out, you know, that these things right happened to our people. Now, this kind of spirit that you bring to this movement and trying to in, in basically make relationships better between the U.S. government, the white people, as well as the American Indian people, it comes from the fact that you are descended from Red Cloud, aren't you? Yes, I am. The chief of the Sioux Indians, right? Yes. Who is, I understand, was is this right, Jim? He was a signatory on the Treaty of 1868 Treaty of Laramie, correct? That's right. Yeah, and you are the great, great granddaughter? Yes, I am. Of Red Cloud? Yes, I am. Good, excellent. Now, we're here today because of a case that you brought to Jim yes. and Terry. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the victims, the families, well, and why you decided to get involved? Kalani, um, one of the victims, Randall, she was my daughter-in-law. Something had to be done. And if you're a Native person, there's not, I would say, out of 100%, 5% of the time you see justice. Yeah. You see the judiciary system that if that crime was committed by a Native on our reservation, he would have sat in prison for 25 years. Yeah, and the person, Hots, I think his name was, right? He only got 51 months. Yes. Killed two people. Yes. Yeah. And he never got charged with Kalani. Yeah. He only got charged with Robert. Wow, that's, that's weird. He took a plea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's like it never happened with her. So is there kind of the general attitude on the reservation that the United States court system is not... Uh, inclined to give American Indians a break or give them equality? When you look at the prison system in the state of South Dakota or your federal prisons, and I know in Sioux Falls, the majority of the inmates there are native, native inmates mm -hmm. because they know that they already lost when they go into those courts. Yeah. And even if they're innocent, they're going to take a plea. They will take a plea. One of the messages that we want to send in this show is that the American Indian, um, if they have a legal issue, should not give up hope. Uh, there are lawyers like Jim and Terry that will take on these cases um, because despite the fact that it may take a time to win a case, there are legal grounds to win these cases. Um, when you, you've had a long relationship with Jim, you know Jim for quite some time? I've known both him and Terry for yeah. years. So you'd highly recommend them to handle any kind of legal case? Yes. What, you handle civil cases primarily, right? Civil? Yes, sir. Civil. Um, 
Well, that's the message we want to send out there today, that there is hope. Yeah, there is. You know, but the Treaty of Laramie, as well as the other treaty means, is, le is a legitimate document. It is. Right? Well, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us. I know you travel a great distance to be on this show, and thank you very much. And this, this show will send a message that there is hope. Yeah, there is. There are lawyers like Terry and Jim, you know, who will take on cases like this and win your case. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. You're welcome. Wopila. And I have one last question for you. There is a Supreme Court case, I think it was 1979, that ruled that the Black Hills, that the Sioux Indian tribes were entitled to compensation. Um, it's, a, it's a substantial amount of money, isn't it? Is, is it in the hundreds of millions or a billion? Or oh, what? it's hundreds of millions. Yeah. I'm not sure it's a billion yet. It may be right now, but it's been drawn interest ever since that. Yeah, so my question is, the, the Sioux Indian tribes have never acknowledged this decision, never cashed a check, if you want to use those words. Who do the Black Hills belong to? Well, it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, it's, it's got to be one per, one organization or another. The government's position is that the Black Hills have, were, were taken and were paid for. But they weren't, but they didn't accept the money. Yeah, well, they haven't accepted the money, but the money's there in, a, you know, in, in trust accounts across yeah. the country. And nobody's using it. Nobody's using it. That, and they've tried. Some tribal members have tried to jar that loose, yeah. which have been unsuccessful. Yeah. I want to thank both of you for being on the show today. We'd love to have you back again. You guys are doing amazing work. It needs to be done. And it's always an uphill battle. Just amazing, isn't it? It is. Um, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.